In this video, we take a look at how to implement the bubble sort. So for the exam, you need to understand the main steps of the bubble sort and any prerequisites of it. You need to be able to apply the algorithm to a data set. You need to be able to identify the algorithm if provided with code. You should be able to read and trace the algorithm and also write the code for a bubble sort using pseudocode or high level language of your choice. A bubble sort orders an unordered list of items by comparing each item with the next one and swapping the items if they're out of order. The algorithm is finished when no more swaps can be made. In effect, it bubbles the largest or smallest item up to the end of the list. The bubble sort is the most inefficient sorting algorithm, but very easy to implement, so it's a popular choice for very small data sets. It's ideal for situations where a simple, easy to program sorting algorithm is required. Here's an illustration to help you visualize a bubble sort. In some pseudocode, we start by initializing a couple of variables with their starting states. N. This variable is used to track how far through the data set we need to check for items to swap on each iteration. We start by setting it to the length of the entire data set. Swapped. This Boolean value is used to indicate whether a swap has taken place each time we go around the inner for loop. We start by setting it to true so we'll enter the main while loop at least once to check for unsorted items. We then enter a while loop, which will continue to execute while the following two conditions are met. N is greater than zero and swapped is equal to true. In other words, this loop will execute until all the items are sorted. Each time around, the while loop assumes there are no items that need to be swapped until we prove otherwise. So we set the swapped variable to false. Now say the length of the data set returned by items.length is 10. Most arrays or lists are zero indexed. That means we want to check indexes zero through nine. So we start by setting n to n minus one. Doing this ensures the entire data set will be checked the first time around for items to swap. This value would decrement by one each time around the outer while loop. The sorted items will gradually bubble up to the end or top of the data set, so there'll be fewer items to check through each time. The program now reaches a nested inner for loop. For each pass through the data set represented by the outer while loop, we need to start at the beginning and work through to the penultimate item of the unsorted data set represented by n minus one. In other words, we need to work through the current subset of items that still need to be checked and sorted. At any point during this inner for loop, if we discover that the item at the current location in the data set is greater than the next item in the data set, we know they must be out of order. In this case, we need to perform two actions. First, we need to swap the two items over. This has been simplified to a single line in pseudocode here. And secondly, we need to set the swapped variable to true, so when we next check the outer while loop, we know we're still in the process of sorting the data set. We continue through the data set, moving the items up as far as it needs to go until it's in the correct place. This process is repeated as many times as necessary until we discover the entire data set has been sorted. Once again, this is the bare bones of the algorithm. In its current form, it doesn't have a data set to sort yet. It doesn't inform the user whether the data set has been sorted successfully and the swap line still needs to be fleshed out. We would need to implement all of this in our chosen high level programming language. Here is some syntactically correct Python code that demonstrates the bubble sort algorithm in practice. 
we've added a hard-coded list called items which contains five American states. This initial list is deliberately unsorted. We've also added a line of code that outputs the contents of the data set once it's been sorted, just so we can prove that it's worked. We start by initialising the variables n equals length of items, that's 5, and swapped equals true. We check if we need to enter the while loop. n is greater than 0 is true, and swapped equals true is true. As both parts are true, we enter the while loop. We now set swap to false and we decrement n by 1. We enter the inner nested for loop for index in range 0 to n. So taking the current value of n, this reads as range 0 to 4. In Python, this means values 0 to 4 but not including 4 itself. Effectively, this means the for loop will execute 4 times. We now compare the item at items index with the item at items index plus one. We're essentially asking the question, is the value of items index greater than the value of items index plus one? Well, item zero is Florida and item zero plus one is Georgia. And if Florida is greater than Georgia is false. So these items do not need swapping around. They're already in order. The for loop increments its internal index from 0 to 1 and we enter the for loop again. This time, items 1 is Georgia and items 1 plus 1 is Delaware. If Georgia is greater than Delaware, now this is true. These items were in the wrong order, so they need to be swapped. So we enter the if statement. The actual swap is performed as a three stage process in Python. We copy the value currently held in items index, that's Georgia, and place it into a temporary variable. We replace the value of the item in items index with the value of the item currently held in items index plus one, that's Delaware. And now we take the value stored out into our temporary variable, that was Georgia, and copy it into items index plus one. We've now swapped the two items over. Before we exit the if statement, we set the Boolean variable swap to true to indicate that a swap has taken place. The for loop increments and its internal index value from 1 to 2 and we enter the for loop again. Once again, we compare the items at items index with the item at items index plus 1. So we're comparing Georgia to Alabama and saying, is Georgia greater than Alabama? Well, it is, so these items are in the wrong order. We'll need to swap them again, so we enter the if statement. We follow the same three stages as we did before for the swap, and we're currently swapping the contents of Georgia with Alabama. We also set the swap value to true again. Now, technically speaking, this doesn't have any effect because it's already true, um, but it still happens. The for loop increments its internal index value from two to three, and we enter the for loop again. Once again, we compare the item at index with the item at index plus one. So now we're comparing the item uh, at item three, that's Georgia, with three plus one, that's California, if Georgia is greater than California. Well, that's true. So these items are in the wrong order and they need to be swapped. We enter the if statement again. We follow the same three-stage process. We're now swapping the contents of Georgia with California. Again, swap is set to true, which has no effect because it's already true. Georgia has successfully bubbled up to the end of the list and is now in the correct location. The for loop increments its index from three to four and we discover we're now outside the required range. We're done executing the inner for loop for now and fall back to the outer while loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop once more n is greater than zero is still true, swapped equals true is true. We've made a swap at least once during the last trip through the while loop. As both parts are true, we enter the while loop again. We now set swapped back to false once more. Remember, each time around the outer while loop, we're going to assume there's nothing that needs to be swapped until we prove otherwise. We decrement n by one. We do this for efficiency. When we hit the inner for loop, we don't need to check the whole data set 
as we know the items that we're currently showing in green are already in their correct place. We enter our inner nested for loop for index in range 0 to n. So taking the current value of n, this reads as range 0 to 3. So in Python, that means 0 to 3, but not including 3, effectively meaning the inner for loop will now execute three times. Last time it executed four times. Now that you should be getting the hang of this algorithm, we'll streamline our explanations. So once again, we ask, is the value of items index greater than the value of items index plus one? Is Florida greater than Delaware? Well, it is, so these items are in the wrong order, so we enter the if statement to swap them. We swap Florida and Delaware over using the temporary variable, and we also set the Boolean variable swap to true to indicate that a swap has taken place. The for loop increments its internal value from zero to one, and we enter the for loop again. Again, we ask, is the item in item index greater than the item in items index plus one? Is Florida greater than Alabama? It is, so these items were the wrong order, so we enter the if statement to swap them. We swap Florida and Alabama over using our temporary variable. The for loop increments its internal index from one to two, and we enter the for loop again. We ask the question again, and this time we find that Florida is greater than California, so these items are in the wrong order, so we enter the if statement to swap them. We swap Florida and California over using the temp variable, and Florida has successfully bubbled up to the end of the list and is now in the correct location. The for loop increments its internal value from two to three. We discover when our outside the required range, we're done executing this inner for loop for now and fall back to our outer while loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop again. n is greater than zero is still true, and swapped equals true is true, as we made a swap at least once during our last trip through the while loop. As both parts are true, we enter the while loop again. As before, we start the while loop by setting swap back to false, and we decrement n by one. Remember, we're doing this for efficiency. When we hit the inner for loop, we don't need to check the whole data set. Both the items in green now are in the correct place. We enter the inner nested for loop for index in range naught to n, so that's zero to two, basically meaning we're gonna run this inner for loop only twice this time. You should be pretty comfortable with the algorithm by this point. So Delaware and Alabama are in the wrong order. So we enter the if statement and swap them. Remember, we also set swap to true to indicate a swap's occurred. The for loop increments its eternal index from zero to one, and we enter the for loop again. Delaware and California are in the wrong order, so we enter the if statement and swap them. Delaware has now successfully bubbled up to the end of the list and is now in the correct location. The for loop increments its internal index value from one to two, we're outside the range, so we're done executing the inner for loop again, and once more, fall back to our outer for loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop. n is greater than zero, that's still true, because n is two. Swapped is true, as we did make a swap during our last trip around the while loop. So both parts are true, we enter the while loop one more time. As before, we start by setting swapped back to false and we decrement n by one. We enter the inner nested for loop and this time we're just going to execute the for loop once. This inner for loop is becoming slightly more efficient each time as more of the list is being sorted. The items we're comparing is Alabama and California. They're in the correct order so we can skip the code inside the if statement. For loop increments its index from zero to one. We discover we're outside the required range. We're already done with executing the inner for loop. And once again, we fall back to the outer for loop. We check if we need to enter the while loop. N is greater than zero is still true. Swapped equals true is now false as no swaps were made during our last trip through the while loop. The while loop requires both conditions to be true 
So we're now done with the while loop and the data set is sorted. The algorithm is complete and we finish off by printing out the contents of the sorted list to the user just to prove that it's worked. So let's consider a few final thoughts. As of our previous videos, what we've presented you here is not the single correct version of a bubble sort, it's simply our implementation. It's quite possible you'll come across slight variations in textbooks, exam papers and other videos. Let's consider a few possible alterations to the original pseudocode that we presented here at the start of the video. In this version, we've replaced the outer while loop with a for loop. We've also removed any reference to setting, updating or tracking of a swap variable. This is a much less efficient than our previous version, as it will perform the maximum number of passes through the data set and check all the items, regardless of how sorted the data already is. However, it's still a bubble sort. In our pseudocode, we assume the data set is implemented using a zero indexed array or list. However, you may be programming in a language that supports a data set or structure that doesn't start at a zero index of the first element and instead starts at one. There have also been attempts to improve the efficiency of the bubble sort, including the reverse in the direction of the algorithm after each iteration. This is known as a cocktail sort. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. Can you successfully implement a bubble sort using a high level program language of your choice? And do you understand how a bubble sort works and can you trace its code in the exam? We know that getting to grips with data structures and all the algorithms associated with them is a very tricky area of the course. And so we've produced a book called Essential Algorithms for A-Level Computer Science that's available on Amazon. It covers all the data structures you need to know about, along with the algorithms you need to perform on them, and it covers all the exam boards. We overview each data structure, discussing its typical applications and the operations you can perform on it. We provide a QR code that jumps off to a useful page of additional resources. We then take each data structure and the algorithms you need to perform and present them first in simple structured English, then in a diagrammatic format, then in pseudocode, and finally, we present you with fully coded algorithms which you need to cover on the data structures in both Python and VB, so you can actually code them up and practice them yourselves.